That's okay. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, he cool. lends it. He, he's, he's generous with it. <laughs> let's let let's make jokes. All right. Hi, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's conversation celebrating the publication of A Guest at the Feast, Colm Toybin's new book published by Scribner, uh, in conversation with Christian Lorentzen. Um, this, this, I, I won't speak for too long because there are many of you who've been waiting for a while, but it's um, a fantastic book of essays, many of them published originally in the London Review of Books, uh, dating from 1995 to 2022. Um, and so I'll just introduce the speakers. So uh, Colm Toybin is the author of 10 novels, including The Magician, his most recent novel, uh, The Master, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, Brooklyn, winner of the Costa Book Award, The Testament of Mary, and Nora Webster, as well as two story collections and several books of criticism. Toybin is the Irene and Sydney B. Silverman Professor of the Humanities at Columbia University, three times shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Christian Lorentzen is a critic and actor who has written for the London Review of Books, Art Forum, the Paris Review, among others. From 2015 to 2018, he was the book critic for New York Magazine. So we'll take any questions at the end, um, and some questions might be emailed from our uh, audience online, and uh, I will leave it to you. All right. Thank you, Daisy. <laughs> Hello, Colm. Good to see you again. Good to see you. How are you? I'm very good. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, you were saying you wanted to begin by making yeah. some marks. Yeah, much. I was going to say how shocked and sad I am at the death of Jack McRae, how um, he was here in this store all the time, and he from the time I started, really, he was really nice to me and just said, look, even if you get five people, just come. But he would have read my book and he would have read all the books that were coming out that season. He was a very good judge of a horse. You know, he was a very good judge of a new novel. He had a great light in his eye and uh, he had a great presence. And uh, I associate him entirely with this building. I know that he's associated with galleries and he's another, he'd another life. But this, I think the vision for this particular bookshop is his. But um, I, I, just the idea that Jack has disappeared and he's not sort of there watching me. He's not going to have the first question ready and he's not read the book, you know, really mm. carefully. Mm. That's just really, really sad. And he was a great man and um, I'm um, just honored to be back um, in his space. But um, hey, Jack, you know. Jack. The last time I saw you was a few years ago, I think. 2019 and you had just come out with an essay in the london review yeah. books uh regarding some matters of uh your personal health yeah and uh everything was all right and had come at a great relief after a time of great um you were tested shall we say uh and that piece now appears as the first piece in this collection and with a very simple first line it all started with my balls <laughs> now the piece has very straightforward power even as as it deals with phases of pure blankness as you put it i'm wondering if writing about cancer you came to it you you the the piece came to you cold or whether you had any literary models in mind? Because I could think of even writers simply of our own acquaintance, particularly Jenny, who, re who obviously many great writers have dealt with that problem. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and there's been a lot of great writing um, on that subject. Yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I promise not to write this piece. I, I hate cancer pieces. I particularly hate cancer pieces by people who survive. Um, <laughs> Because the whole idea, you know, my battle against cancer was something in my character that prevailed. And uh, the word battle is a really sick word because it suggests that people who didn't battle hard enough were the, ones, were the ones who lost. It's not like that. It's just not like that. 
And um, so um, I promised not to write it. No one asked me to write it, by the way. There was no big, oh, you know, outcry, yeah. where's your piece? <laughs> um, I, so obviously, I think anyone, uh, any editor I worked for was living in dread that this piece was going to arrive on their desk, you know, poor me, my poor life, my poor testicles, gone. And will never come back. And it's being, it's being, it's being cut up slowly in various hospitals to examine its insides and stuff. And um, I was walking along the street, minding my own business, which, as I said, I don't do enough. And um, I, a sentence came into my head that just, 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 I like the shape of the sentence, even though I went to change at various times because it all and ball, like you're not yeah. sure it's exactly a right sentence. Like it's not, I wouldn't, you know, if a student wrote it, I would change it. But um, I just, it was, um, it all started with my balls. I thought it was just a good way of getting going. But I didn't mean to get going. And then I, I was on them. Um, I had come back to Colombia to work, having ended chemo in about November. And then all the blood clot nonsense and, your, your, uh, whatever, all the other things they, they, they threw at me. Um, and uh, I came back to Colombia not having, because I was off for that semester. So it was just the six months I was away was the six months where all of me had fallen off, basically. And uh, parts I most treasure, some of them, but also my eyebrows, which I like. And um, that uh, I didn't tell anyone that, I, you know, because I didn't see any need to. And then I arrived back, obviously looking like a scarecrow. People were so polite on the car. They didn't say, look at you. Only one person, my neighbor said, you, meaning look at you. And um, so I told no, and I didn't talk about it. It meant that I went back to, into the classroom. Poor students, <laughs> my God, a scarecrow has come in to teach us. And um, and so um, this was spring break, and um, I had you know two weeks off, and I had that sentence written down somewhere. And just every day, I just kept going with it, w w without any idea. I mean, I knew that most publications wouldn't use it; that it was just there was something wrong with it. And then I sent it to our mutual friend, Mary Kay Wilmers, at Under Review of Books, with a note, which I meant, saying, I'm not sure this is for you. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> she hates maudlin pieces. You know, she hates yeah. any form of self-pity or sentimentality. And if it's in the magazine, it's not in the magazine because she's just cut it out of your right. piece. Yeah. So I thought she would write back saying, I'm glad you're better. See you soon. You know, uh, <laughs> something like that. But, um, I, but she, yes, she wrote back and said she'd use it, you know, and that's, uh, that's how it started. If she had, if she hadn't, if she hadn't done that, I would not, I would not have sent it out anywhere else. I wasn't going right. to like get rejection slips for your cancer piece or something. <laughs> there's something about that. There's something, I don't know. Oh, yeah, just, you know yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good luck placing it elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it should be said that the piece also ends magnificently with the literary device of personification. The, the one solitary ball remaining, missing the other. They used to finish each other's sentences. I was, yeah, yeah. One, one, that was wonderful. Another one of my favorite details, uh, I'll have to admit, perhaps this says something uh, wrong about me, is that one of the initial conversations you, you have with a nurse talking about the teetotaling pioneers of Ireland and their uh, their vulnerability in the face of chemotherapy because they have no experience with alcohol. Yeah, the, the, the nurse asked me, I mean, you know they have all these questions, and she asked me, are you a heavy drinker? And of course, as was always, no, 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 not, not at all. You know, and, and I, I mean, the, you know, not, and she suddenly looked, oh, that's a pity. I thought, what, a pity? And she said, yeah, she used the word pioneer, which in Ireland means someone who, who agrees not to drink. It's a religious thing, the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. She said, um, the thing is that chemo it is a sort of, it's like alcohol. It's a sort of poison thing that enters your system and your system has to deal with it. But obviously the pioneers suffer most because they have no, <laughs> it's a big shock to their system. They've never had the hangover, you know, yeah. so... I thought that was an amazing idea. Yeah. 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 And and actually to you know, I haven't had a I haven't had a drink since. Oh really? No, I'm completely oh, dry. I'm I've, uh, I've turned into the dullest we person the, alive. That yeah. night we were at the scratcher, you weren't <laughs> that night in the scratcher yeah. I was drinking water okay, okay. or soda as they call uh, it here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Huh. I I, I mean the because the whole point of chemo is that it's it's a liquid that comes into you and changes your mood and gives you all sorts of you know mm. and you feel awful in the morning. Well, I'm not gonna do that willingly again. You know, oh, sure. if you don't mind. Huh. You know. Now I would it did I mean, I don't know how, how much you want to dwell on the strange things it did to your senses. 
but I was struck by the fact that you 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 said you couldn't listen to music or watch films, yet the seagulls of Dublin created stronger impressions on you than it's as if you had never noticed them before. Yeah, I mean, there's a crisis in Dublin which has been caused by seagulls, and if you're lying on a sofa in the summer you notice it more than other people who are just walking on the street. I mean, they're just taking over and they're getting bigger and bigger. There are more restaurants and there's, and there's just garbage is coming out in the street and, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're breeding. And I was in a top floor and the, the little little seagull, I mean, little, were, were on my roof you know, through the night making little noises. And then in the morning squawking again, big seagulls, big bickering seagulls. And they were high in the sky and then they would come low towards your window. And, and I mean, this is just to stop, you know, something has yeah. to be done. But um, <laughs> it's similar um, in Florida. I was once there as a child and a seagull swooped out of the sky and pulled a grilled cheese sandwich out of my hand. Right. They're really vicious animals in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm against them, totally yeah. against seagulls. <laughs> and um, but the yeah, the other things, I mean, the I mean, the chemo is strange. It, um, the nurses used to call it the juice. Yeah. And I liked that. Here's, you know, uh, well, there'll be the juice. We'll be we'll bringing the juice at eleven. The juice. And uh, yeah, the um, strange thing is that you think that your that your smell and your taste are the same. That they come from the same. I don't know what what do we call gland or uh, muscle. I mean, whatever you have in here. Organs, and yeah. what? Oh, organ. Organ. Yeah. Good. And but with uh, with chemo, you can you can't taste at all but your smell becomes acute. Huh. So acute that when you're walking on the street, you can smell people's aftershave. I mean, you know that some guys have awful aftershave. You can, you can smell it coming towards you. And it really, it's like a secret. I mean, it's very disturbing. And music is just a jumble of sound. Huh. And uh, your hair falls out. I mean, uh, and uh, you see, because you can't taste at all, a glass of water could be, this could be sulfuric acid. I mean, the whole point of taste is to stop yourself drinking sulfuric acid. Because you Yet taste it. Seemed, it's, it's you were right of your imagination going wild for, yeah. for flavors you didn't even Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was saying that I wouldn't, I, I can't cook. I, I think domestic life is, is really a shame. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a waste of time. I think, about I the, think of all the other things you could be doing. And, uh, but I began to dream of marinating steak. <laughs> and I mean, marinade for me just be the sort of stuff that you use to clean the toilet. I don't know what marinade <laughs> is. But um, in any case, I would lie there thinking about marinating steak. And so, it was, yeah, I was just a complete idiot for all that time. And I, and I stupidly wrote an article about it, and it's in a book. Wow. <clears throat> it's wonderful. And, and uh, you know, this book begins rather innocently, I would say. So let's stick with the, part, the next a relatively innocent chapter, uh, which is the title piece. Now, who is the guest and what is the feast exactly? Oh, um, I think life is the feast and yeah. I'm the guest. It's as right. simple as that. Okay. You know, you know, you think you wake up in the morning, you know, especially now that I'm not drinking and you think, uh, you know, it's good, it's good. All right. Good. good. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. I thought, yeah. uh, but I thought I always think I might be missing something. No. You know, oh, there's a slight joke, which is um, in that Scottish play written by Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And there's a marvelous moment, one of my favorite moments in literature, where the King of Scotland, who seemingly you can't mention his name with actors around, the King of Scotland <laughs> is he's saying because it's considered bad luck. Um, he um, he's saying to Banco, who he's planning to have murdered, you know, really quite brutally uh, with, with his son. And so Banco is about to go off, but Banco is expected back. But of course, he knows he's not coming back. It's going to be chopped up. And he says to him, "Fail not our feast." I think it's lovely because yeah. the feast is going to be, they're going to feast on Banco. Mm. But I think, it's, I think it's, I have a friend who always says that if he's inviting you to dinner, <laughs> fail not our feast. <laughs> so the word feast just has yeah. another, you know, yeah. But I like guest the way ST and mm -hmm. feast. I just mm -hmm. came to my head. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I wish it was a quote from Tennyson or something, but it isn't. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, I put on the string quartet of Frederick May today after reading of your encounter with him and you your I, I wanted to hear what music that was either completely non-irish or every bit irish sounded like and you're very you immediately the opening lines were just as confident as you've said and he wrote he wrote that in vienna when he was i mean tell us about your encounter with yeah. this man at, there, at the, there was at I, I i suppose that there, that there was a time in dublin and before the city grew rich, 
when you were never quite sure who you would meet or, you know, but there was one particular evening when um, in a place called the Arts Club, which was basically, it was a good name for it because it was a place for late night drinking, really. But you could stay in the club. It was sort of cheap. And um, there, was this, uh, there was this old man just at the edge of the company all the time, annoying me and everyone. And uh, he had no money and he wanted us to buy him drinks. And he, um, I started to talk about his life and, he was in France. It just didn't seem likely he'd been in France. And it seemed likely he'd been just around the corner, you know, some dump. You know. <laughs> but for some reason, if someone said something to him, and I realized, I said to him, sorry, excuse me, but are you Patrick Collins? I, yeah, of course I'm Pat. And of course, he is the great painter of that generation. His, his landscapes, I mean, his paintings now go for a lot of money. But it isn't just that. It is that, uh, that over his lifetime, he painted some of the great images um, of the Irish landscape. And they're subtle images. It's not, and he wasn't just out painting the sea or something. He, there's a sort of inwardness in the way he worked, the sort of framing. And I couldn't believe it was broken down absolutely without a studio, absolutely without any money. And that wasn't strange in those years. And there was one, one day I'm, 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 I'm in a bar, so I'm, I'm um, I, suppose what, I suppose I'm 20 years old. And um, this little fellow comes up to me and he wants a drink. It's Saturday morning. And... Uh, Eventually, he really, I mean, he wants to come back the following week because he mm. thinks a book is still banned that isn't still banned. But I have a copy. Of, oh, it gets all mixed up. And, oh, why am I agree, agreeing to see this man a, a week later? And he's small and wizened and he looks slightly insane. He comes back a week later to that same place. I'm so glad I turned up with an LP, which was the first recording made, which had just come out that week, of his only string quartet that he wrote in Vienna when he was when he was 25 his name is frederick may and the lp it's on spotify I, it, yeah, it, it, it's it's, it's in two movements the second movement is just so beautiful but it isn't irish music in other words it doesn't have an you know it doesn't sound it doesn't have the lilt that you might get in celtic music mm -hmm. he was in vienna he he was studying weber and he was studying berg he was studying schoenberg and so it's an effort on the part of an irish composer circa 1936 who was homosexual he was beginning to suffer from it from a terrible disease called tinnitus which would affect his hearing. And um, he, he was eventually taken in by a group of nuns. But there was a story, he, he, he had a sour wit. You know, there was something sour about him that I liked. And um, he wasn't just this, you know, this defeated genius, although he was certainly that too. But um, um, he, when he came back from Vienna, the only job he could get was as musical director of the Irish National Theatre called the Abbey Theatre, which was putting on terrible plays in those years and was run by a well-known bully called Arnon de Blyde, and no one liked him. And um, he picked on May because May, of course, was always drunk, always late, and utterly contemptuous of, of his own job. And all Frederick May would do would say, when he dies, I will dance on his grave. And I have a friend who was in the pub just around the corner from the graveyard after they had buried Ernand de Blyde with great pomp and ceremony because he'd been a patriot and he was involved in the revolution also. So a big Irish flag on his coffin and the army band, all rubbish uh, about his burial. And Frederick May was small, so he waited behind a gravestone. And he waited until they filled in the grave and he waited until everybody went to the pub and he stood on his own as the light declined and he danced on his grave as he said he would. And he went down to the pub and he did the dance. You know, he went into the pub and said, I dance, I have danced on his grave. And he stood up and he did the dance that he had just done. He, you know, he did the choreography had been worked out years earlier. And he did the dance. And um, so I, I, I Was there a toast after that? Well, my, I, I loved, I just loved that story so much. But I found it out years later. Mm -hmm. but, but he gave me the, um, the LP. Yeah. And... You know, it was years later, of course, I discovered, you know, I mean, I was 20, he was 70, and yeah. I, he was gay, and, but it wasn't, I mean, there was no sense of it being anything other than he was lonely, and he, he wanted, you know, he wanted to talk about his, L, he wanted to show someone mm -hmm. his LP, and unfortunately, he was, at this stage, living with a group of nuns, and obviously, they wouldn't have been that interested in his LP. Right. Yeah. Or the band, uh... Or the McGregor band writer, the, the, the band yeah. John McGarren's novel, The Dark, that he thought was still banned. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, but I discovered, if you look back, in, in his 30s, he wrote serious essays about how an Irish contemporary music could be written and could matter. So, I mean, it wasn't as though he was always in decline. There were, there were obviously years where he mattered. But, but that's when I met him. And it was, it stayed in my mind. It's one of those things where 
writing without a commission sometimes is great. Right? It was one night I was at home on my own. I just went upstairs and I started to write that piece yeah. without, and I didn't publish it. Oh, yeah, so, so it wasn't I was, for any. I was unclear about the origins of that piece. It seems it just, to, it seems it. It said it was for Penguin Shorts. Was that some kind of short-lived ebook? Yeah, it was it? Concern? Yeah, yeah. Penguin Shorts asked me if I had twenty-five thousand words to spare, <laughs> and you know very well. Yeah, you know. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Look at look at this. Look at that. And so, yeah, I uh, waste not, want not. You know. And uh, I told them absolutely. And uh, so I, I had all That's those pieces. Beautiful. Piece. I had all those pieces on the computer with uh, with, yeah. with no home to go to. Yeah. You know. And I, I found a brief home for them. And I put no, them here we, again. We see your parents before you're born. We see them you know as you grow up we see you as a, a schoolboy and then uh among the hippies um <clears throat> okay i i was curious about so it was it, it was simply conceived as fragments or as fragments you yeah, happen yeah, to yeah, have it yeah, on yeah, hand yeah, yeah all right um i'm interested in in, in that piece you you don't describe yourself as the happiest of young students or necessarily the, the most when you're when when you you're trying to get out of class b and you're trying to get into the the class with the teacher who makes you do irish noun declensions and even your father says they're too difficult for a student of your age yet in the next essay you're the you're a 20 something editor of your own magazine uh mcgill how did i i'm uh, perhaps for selfish reasons, I'm just curious about how uh, you your beginnings in journalism. Um, I, I sort of drifted into journalism. Um, I, I've never really written a news story, so you know that business of sources claim that the president is about to fall off a rock. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never right. I've never known how to write that. I've never really been able to. Mm -hmm. So what what happened was, um, it was, it's part of the Americanization of Ireland, really, where. Um, a group of people, all of whom would have read that Tom Wolfe book, The New Journalism, right. would have been reading Didion, would have been reading Norman Mailer uh, and um, Tom Wolfe, um, began, there were two different magazines, one was more political and the other was more cultural. And I, I edited one and I was features editor of the other when I was pretty young, really, partly because I had a lot of energy and, uh -huh. and, and um, just, I just fell into those jobs, you know, and, um, and it was nice. Um, but the par part of the reason was to, so that you could write long form, so that you could send somebody, you know, if, if someone had an idea, you know, you could make it work for them. Yeah. And, uh, Did you get to go traveling yourself? Um, no, afterwards, um, when I got fired from the, I got found out, I just <laughs> sent her home, really. Um, I did go, I did find myself in Buenos Aires mm -hmm. in the, um, what, in the spring of 1985. And there's a new film just out, which is called Buenos oh, Aires, yeah. so 1985. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, You're I was there. in that court. Uh -huh. I mean, there's a oh. moment where I can point. That's where I was sitting up there. Not that the court is real, but but I mean, there were very few journalists there, mm -hmm. and it was a very odd time because the um, everyone was unsure because because there was no serious journalism. Everyone was unsure. Did the disappearances actually occur? So they commissioned um, Ernesto Sabato, the novelist, to to to, to do a prima facie book saying, what is the evidence for this? And instead of looking for people, he went to buildings and he looked, he found the buildings where the torture took place. And then he could, then he spoke to the people who manned the buildings. And then he put together a picture from these buildings of the extent of this. And, um, and the fact that, you know, there, were, there was, um, I suppose the disappearances were, you know, pre-planned, organized and on a large scale. Mm. And um, so then Alfonsin, who was the, who, who, who was the president, decided that, that, that they should put only the generals on trial. Forget the tortures, forget the ones below. All that came later. But at the beginning, just let's put the leaders on trial. And this court happened every day between about three in the afternoon and about midnight or one in the morning, where all the people who had survived or the relatives of those who disappeared came and gave evidence, and some of the evidence was beyond you know, wildest in the levels of brutality. But there was one moment where a former president of Argentina, General Lanús, a very noble fellow, came in and just said that he had come in to find his cousin. And um, you know, he had access to everybody. And when he said, um, you know, what is going on here? What is it? Like, you're looking for one person. Do you know the number of people we throw out of the planes every night into the Atlantic? Because that's what they did, yeah. and um, so, and the, the the description of the torture. The the secondary school students looked for just part of the age. They looked for cheaper fares for secondary school students, and they took them in, and they murdered most of them. 
and one of them survived and his evidence again he's he's he, his evidence is in the film mm -hmm. but he came into the court and his eyes were still he said from crying into the blindfold you know and uh so i stayed there and i and i covered that and um uh, you know, I eventually I wrote a novel, but the novel wasn't about, I didn't want to write a novel about the torture because I thought it wasn't my job to imagine something. You know, my method as a novelist is ironic or, or, or a lot of silences and a lot of evasions, and it won't work for big historical things. So I wrote about the aftermath, the years like 87, 88, when Argentina moved, people became slowly aware of what had actually happened on their doorstep. But that was, um, yeah, that was yeah. yeah. This after these two light pieces, your first, your brush with death, then your fragmentary education. Uh, the book gets into essentially various confrontations with evil. Uh, a lot of the result of the the legacy of the Catholic Church in Ireland. Um, and you write about uh, our various popes, and you're able to write about them. I, I remember when I first started reading you on Pope John Paul II. I think that isn't there an LRB piece that isn't in here? No, no, there isn't. They're all there. They're yeah. all there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're, I had never been able, as a Catholic and a former altar boy myself, I had never really been able to think of the popes as men. Um, <clears throat> I, you are able to capture them as men, but also as these charismatic figures. Uh, how was that difficult for you? As a, was it was it easy? Was it what? What's the process of putting aside the the faith or the legacy of your Catholic upbringing when you're when you come to these subjects? Um, I suppose the first thing really is that is is before the popes comes to boarding school, you know. Right. And uh, yeah. does anyone remember um, Women in Love, Ken Russell's film of the D.H. Lawrence novel, where there's an extraordinary scene where it, who who is it? Um, Alan, Alan Bates and and um, Oliver Reed get naked mm -hmm. and they have a fight in front of the fire. And you know, it's it's the cameras moving right around. And you can see all of them. I haven't seen the film. Well, yeah. Well, it's, look, it's the most remarkable yeah. scene. I saw that one night in probably 1971 in the room of a priest called Father Collins, who later went to jail mm. at about midnight when myself and about three or four other boys in our pajamas had sneaked across this sort of gothic um, building of all different cloisters and corridors and little stairs avoiding anyone who might find us to go up to this priest's room so we could watch a, a program called the late late show which was a late night chat show just and we all sat around in our pajamas watching this and the, it just stayed on mm -hmm. to a bbc program and we saw all of us i'd never seen anyone naked before i mean modesty was the most important thing more than morale you know like you just didn't get naked in ireland yeah. you know people just didn't <laughs> ever like do that you know like showers had doors on uh -huh. you know and boys had their underpants on you know and um and not to speak of girls and uh, so i, I mean it was just that image of this priest who would later abuse uh, really a lot of people and it, it, we know it in enormous detail because they gave evidence in court against him but um so um th th that school i mean they sent me to boarding school when i was 15 and uh the boarding school later became famous because it became, it looked as though this was a sort of hotbed of a pedophile activity on the part of the clergy. And it looked as though there was a, there was a ring involved. There wasn't, I, I knew, I could have told them at the beginning there wasn't because they were so embarrassed, all of them, and so shamed, ashamed. The notion they would have even mentioned it to each other. They all did it on their own, in their own different ways, in their own rooms, different times of the day and night, picking on different people for this purpose. Um, the, um, the reason why Father Collins, we all went back to our dormitories. Um, I mean, we went back very freely. It was all fine. His room was great because I could phone home from his room. There was only one phone between 300 boys. So you could go up to his room and use his phone. He always had a nice box of chocolates and he had a stereo. And there were other priests you could use their rooms. If you wanted to have a bath, you go into their bathroom. They didn't touch guys like me who were sort of um, assertive or, you know, like ready to make noise. And they picked on poor country fellas uh -huh. who looked a bit weaker, 
who maybe were in the C class, who, you know, they would just call them up to their was rooms, like, you know, O C C dimension C. I mean, B was, B was, yeah. And, but anyway, the, the, so that was my, you know, um, watching, John Paul II came as an enormous shock, I suppose, because he was so articulate. And he was ready to travel so much, and he seemed so enigmatic. And the night I saw him in Poland, in Czestochowa, I mean, there were a million young people. Uh, and they, they gave us, uh, we, we could hear everything he said on, it was all translated. Uh -huh. So even things he said under his breath, uh -huh. you, you know, you could hear. But um, he didn't mention sex once. He didn't mention the commandments. He didn't mention rules. He spoke about love. And he spoke about the challenge that love, that really using love in the world might be. He, people were really inspired by him. And it began by him walking slowly uh, up these steps, uh, steps up very high because the monastery is up very high. And with all the lights on him. And then he sat down and he simply did this. Mm. And he did it for quite a long time and there wasn't a sound. It was the most theatrical. He judged it perfectly, but he judged perfectly also not to hector these people about sex and about. Uh, uh, so it was a question of trying to work out what does this guy mean. There was, there was a marvelous moment the next morning because I honestly I, I was always ready for them because if they'd any sense they would have just stood up one morning and said we're giving up on the following things. Women can be priests if they want to be priests. Priests can get married all they want, and we're just giving up on all that. If they had, I just kept feeling that they would see sense. I was obviously wrong, uh, the, <laughs> but were, we were all, every journalist was told to be at some place for a, a really important press conference the following morning. This is in Chesterhover, the place of the Black Virgin, and to be in the monastery and to, uh, not to fail. It was to tell us that a rumor was being spread that Danuta, the wife of Lech Valencia, that Danuta had spent a night in the monastery. And they wanted to make clear that no woman ever had or ever would spend a night in that monastery. I went, oh, da, da, yeah, da, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was, oh, you yeah, scoop, scoop. And, uh, but what we learned about him slowly was how opposing the Soviets had given him a great deal of strength and also a sort of weakness in that he could not see any criticism of the church as being, in, in a way, applicable to him. That, that, that he was not ready for any form of debate or any form of argument, that that, that, that was a simple matter to do with good and evil. And, and he, was, he was on the side of good, and good involved the full, sort of the full panoply of Catholic doctrine, including its rules. And he wasn't ready for any debate on any matter. And uh, that coming, you know, because we, we were so used to people from the other side of the Eastern Bloc, yeah. that came as a shock because his, I began to look at him you know, and I, he, I saw him in Ireland. I saw him in Rome a few times. When I say saw him, I just I got as close as I could to him, just watching him. And there, it's that lovely thing that, that, that you, can, you get it in Ireland quite a bit with a man where there's a big difference between his mouth and his eyes, where the mouth is a stubborn, hard thing under certain pressures, and the eyes are always soft. And with him, there was always that sense that, that, that he could speak to millions, but actually there was something very very stubborn about him. In the middle of the whole thing, he got this man called Ratzinger yeah. as, his right, as his right hand man. And um, Ratzinger said something absolutely marvelous that this day has, I suppose, filled my, filled my days and some of my nights with joy and glee because he said, yes, of course, homosexual acts are obviously wrong. I mean, that's clearly wrong because homosexuals are not married to each other and sex outside marriage is wrong. And anyway, it's just wrong. But he said more than that. He said that the the being homosexual itself was morally disturbed. That the act, that the act was wrong, but but the actual essential thing, I'm afraid he got that from certain ideas in Germany. Mm. Uh, that you know, if you, if you're a gypsy, it's your gypsiness that we're seeing, and nothing else you have. Platonism. Yeah, and it had caused it yeah. had caused the Holocaust. Actually, if if he doesn't mind, and uh, <laughs> so I realized. I mean, I just if I'm sitting at home on a Saturday night, and, and I'm watching a rerun of Bernadette of Lourdes, I'm still morally, you know, just by being, I'm Benedict thinks I'm morally 
you know, dis disordered, it was his word. And he, he wrote this first under John Paul II, who said it was fine. And he wrote it more when he became Pope. Yeah. And, um, While wearing those red shoes. Yeah, I mean, it was, the, your friend, the, the London Review of Books, um, you know, sent me a book called Is the Pope Gay? by this very cheeky Italian guy who had no evidence at all that he was gay, but he just put it on the title <laughs> of the book. And of course, I could put it on the title of my review. But I'm a much more responsible person. <laughs> yeah. I'm much more responsible. She than this, loved books like that. Than, yeah, than this Italian journalist. But, but actually, you know, um, the, um, the account everyone gives of what it's like to be a priest in Rome is it's, it's like, um, it's just heaven, you know, yeah. and people hate having to go back, you know, if you have, if you're Polish and they sent you back to some godforsaken Polish place and you've just been in Rome where it, it, it isn't just the sex, it's the gossip. And it isn't just the gossip, it's the food. And, and so it's, 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 it's absolute heaven for them. And there's no one talks about being gay since everyone is gay in a very special way. <laughs> you know, it isn't as though they're all like joining movements. Right. No, they're just all gay. And uh, there, there are various ways. If you want to know if they're really gay, you just study uh, the bishop, say, it's just bishop. And you just look behind him to see who's driving him or who's holding his umbrella or who's going to look after him. And you realize that they're out of that calendar. You know that calendar they sell every year of beautiful clerical. And among the most beautiful men was a man called George Gerswein, who was um, actually living with this, with this pope. And I'm not suggesting that they were living in sin, because how, who, am, who am I to judge? But it did look strange to have a sort of George Clooney look, if you like that sort of guy, George Clooney lookalike, walking along by the Pope, and they're both laughing at the same jokes, both being Bavarian. Right. You know, there's it's a certain Bavarian. He may have loved him because he was Bavarian, but, there were, but it must have been nice waking in the morning to have Georg smiling at you. And, um, but in the middle of the whole thing, you know. He, you your shoes. And bringing you your lovely, lovely red shoes and your and your your pink linings, and he, um, yeah, he brought it to a new level the whole business really of you know of Roma, yeah. and uh, it was tremendous fun then reading his vicious sermons against people he didn't like, like like me, you know, and um, and uh, and then the next guy that came it was, it was trouble for me too because. Uh, I just asked a simple question. You know, this man who smiles all the time, Pope Francis, he's always grinning and smiling. He's always forgiving people. And, you know, and, uh, where, where, where was this fellow in 1977, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82? If everyone doesn't mind. Like mm -hmm. since, since his country was in this extraordinary situation where the military were dragging people off the streets without any habeas corpus or trial or anything else and murdering them. Um, like, what was he saying or doing? And you know, it's it's ambiguous. It's not a simple thing. He wasn't on the side of the military, but the but but the but the heroes of this situation are the mothers of the of the Plata de Mayo, who were the mothers of those who disappeared, or the grandmothers, and they went down and very bravely stood there, saying, "Yeah, take us too, but we're not going. We're we're staring at you." I mean, it was out of Antigone. You know, we're staring at you until you until you tell us where our children are. And uh, they never liked him or trusted him. He was never on their side. He never went down in solidarity with them. He was the head of the Jesuits in Argentina at that time. And you know, there are individual cases. There are two priests who blame him for having them arrested. But I, I, I can't find enough evidence for that. I don't think that's true. But what he did do was he did stand back. He did stand away from it. And he did. There, there's a six hour interrogation of him where he really is brought into trial. It's on YouTube, it's in Spanish, and you watch it, and, and, and you realize there's not a smile going on here, but he's, but he's saying things like, I didn't know that they were taking babies, you know, because they would, they, would, they would take in pregnant women, and um, then the woman would have the baby, and they would take the baby from her, and she, the baby would be adopted by a military family. And it's, it's become a huge problem in Argentina because there are people brought up by these often very kind parents who learn later that they have no DNA in connection. And um, he um, said he didn't know about this. And they, they do question him. And he has to confess that he did know, in fact, that, 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 that you know, this business of, well, who was I? I didn't know. I was, nobody knew. Who knew? <clears throat> you know, he knew enough to know, but he's, it, it would not have helped if he had denounced the, the, the military. The military were too determined. In those years, so it wouldn't have. It really he would have. have he, would have he, he would. He would have gone down. He would have leave the country. It's yeah. afterwards. He never. That trial I, that I attended. He did not support that trial. He was against that trial being being held, and he did not support. You know the, the aftermath. He did not see as as this uh, 
dreadful thing that had occurred in Argentina that would have to be brought into the open. He didn't see that. He's a very different figure in those years in Argentina than the Buena Serra Roma figure that we saw on the on the figure. I just thought that maybe it was worth pointing out, you know, that, that it was uh, maybe, you know, it was one of the reasons, one of the reasons for being a guest at the feast was so I could really just pour the wine on the, on the wrong, you know, the wrong, you know. Uh, <clears throat> parallels with the character comes up in the third section of your book, Francis Stewart, who's, I, I was not aware until coming back to this piece. I guess I hadn't read it when it first came out in the LRB. I was not aware of this uh, chapter. I mean, it, you point out it has parallels with Ezra Pound and his fascist broadcasts in Italy. Um, uh, but an, an, another, you, it, it leads you to some statements about whether writers should be good people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it does. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's a live question these days. It's still. a lot. Of, just, I, um, there's a, there's a, there's a, some review in the Times Book Review of a novel I haven't read and hadn't even heard of the other day that said, reading this book will make you a better person. Ah. And uh, a mutual friend of ours and I were on the phone today. How do you define that exactly? Certainly avoiding war crimes would, might fit in there. Um, <laughs> um and avoiding uh, making broadcasts on behalf of a, aggressive, uh, warring fascist regimes. Like Hitler? Yeah. Um, I, I was 17 and I went to university and in the first week there was an event, uh, I was free for, for the Literature Society and, uh, and I went to it and it included, it had two writers. One was the, it was introduced by Seamus Heaney and it had two writers. Um, one was the American poet, James Tate, and again, he read a poem that I've never forgotten, you know, the famous poem about his father. And, um, and beside him was sitting Francis Stewart. Francis at this time, this, this is 1972, so Francis has to, be, has to be 70 in his early 70s. And uh, he's tall and strong. He just says, my book, Blacklist, he speaks in a sunny, funny foreign accent, my book, Blacklist, Section H, has only been recently published. I wrote it many years ago. It was censored. No one wanted to know what the story I had to tell that when I went to Germany in 1940, I went to be crucified. I went to find the place of crucifixion so I could experience it. I, I broadcast for Hitler. I was arrested by the Allies afterwards. And you go, hold, hold on, you, just, what, you, you, you did what for Hitler? And then he said, I had to leave my wife in, uh, in Ireland behind. Of course, you know, Isolt and her mother. And then he says, you know, her mother was more gone. I said, hold, hold on, your mother-in-law was Maud gone? You know Maud gone? Yeats's muse yeah. wrote all the poems when you were old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire. Take down this book and slowly read of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. You know, you know the, the Maud gone was his mother-in-law. And, and we went to the wow. bar afterwards and I sat beside Frances and said, what was Maud gone like? You know, because she was like, I mean, honestly, yeah. it was um, the strange. But in any case, Frances continued to write. And I became a journalist. And Dublin is small. And Francis and his next wife, Madeline, who had also been involved in the Hitler business, um, were out a lot in Dublin. And they always had something interesting to say about everything. And they liked restaurants. And they um, liked people who were very young. And uh, they could not have been more charming and in a way more spiritually intense. That Francis's idea was that the suffering caused by his imprisonment afterwards had given him a special way of seeing the world. He'd also been interned um, by the Irish government and during the Irish Civil War for being, a, for being a militant Republican. And he'd been a friend of Lima Flaherty who wrote The Informer. So he'd been, he'd been twice involved uh, you know, at moments where um, I suppose people were, people were called on to behave decently. And you know, yeah, he, yeah. he emphatically did not behave decently. Um, and uh, yes, eventually, I'm you know, eventually there, there was a set up as sort of the equivalent of the American Academy of Arts and Letters in Ireland. And, um, and that can give people the, the highest honor. About five people can hold this honor. Um, Samuel Beckett held it. Um, Seamus Heaney held it. And it was offered to Francis as, as a great novelist. And of course, uh, some people just went nuts. Some say like, we, like, you cannot honor this man who, who, who has defiled the, the whole idea of the, of the word. 
by broadcasting for Hitler, whose novels have not, you know, have, have not sought to exonerate him as much as to enter further into what that darkness that he sought was like. And, um, you know, that he is, he is not to be honored in, which, in a state organization because the organization in Ireland is actually funded by the state. It is right. an arm of the state. Is the state to, to honor this man who is now 80-something um, it's exactly the same argument. The Bollingen Prize for Ezra Pound. Can the peace and cantos be given the Bollingen Prize? Mm. And and of course, you know. So the so so I ha my, my problem was that I voted yes. I, I voted for him to get the the award. And then of course, you go home and you think that couldn't have been right, <laughs> you know. And if it's not right, how come it's not right? And if if it was even slightly right, in what way could it have been right? So I had to sort of work all that out. Um, and um, you know, I'm not sure I come particularly well out of the piece, um, but I'm not sure Francis does either because the novel that I love, the novel that took me over is a novel called Blacklist Section H. And it was, at one stage, it was a Penguin classic, this book. And uh, I was overwhelmed by the amount of, this, you know, it's, it's a young person's book where you just hate the world and you think everyone's a hypocrite and you want to find some, some, some special place where there will be purity, where you can be washed clean of all the stupidity. But he would have included democracy when he said stupidity, which I would never have done. Didn't he make a remark to you that democracy yeah. has yeah, a way of one, scum Only scum. one night did he ever come clean. He said, come, don't you think democracy is just where the scum come up to the top? <laughs> I said, Francis, stop! Like, don't, like, we're in a restaurant, you know, like, keep it down. <laughs> like, keep it down. Um, and um, so, uh, uh, you know, trying to work out what it was like to have known somebody like that. You know, that, you see, Ireland was neutral in the war. So, so it wasn't as though there was anyone, it wasn't as though we had survivors of the Holocaust in, in the society, or, or we, we, we didn't have even that many Jewish people in the country. So that it, it, somehow or other, I wondered if being isolated in that way from the real evil of the war had actually given us some sort of mixture of innocence and pure stupidity, which had, had been handed on to me, thank you, and that I would have to sort of deal with, you know. But the other thing I said in the piece is that I, I, I actually think that evil, that, that, that we do have a duty as novelists to deal with evil. And that um, including to have characters who, 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 who are, you know, that we have to let the devil into the novel. And if we don't do that, we're going to end up writing social comedies about adultery in, in you know, wherever, we, you know, that, in other words, the, uh, the concept of, uh, that I think, oh, I think what I wrote was that, it's, it, that the damned actually have to be let into a novel. It's time we dealt with the damned. Have I made myself clear? I agree. <laughs> I agree. I agree heartily. Um, Marilyn Robinson, another subject of yours in here, mm. and the problem of the religious as characters in novelistic in a novel in the novel form, which is, as you say, has to be secular. What uh, what it, her version of dealing with this problem? How successful do you make it, and how does her prairie Christianity compare with the Catholicism that you inherited? Oh, um, I, As a novelist. I, I, I think it's very difficult to get a character in a novel to pray. You know, you think about Jane Austen, imagine if, you know, she knelt down that night and she asked God you know, to give her 10,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or think think of Isabel Archer in Portrait of a Lady. If in the middle of her woe she went and she does go into you know a religious space, you know, mm. but would she ask God? Characters just don't. The novel loves it loves money. It loves it loves choices, chances. It loves people facing their destiny with, with the with with full filled with ill will or coincidence or chance. But the idea of God controlling all this, the novelist loses all your power if you let God in. And suddenly you have glory in home looking yeah. at a tree and just thinking yeah. how it's full of grace yeah you, you know, have a um, passage i remember i always remember that sentence. yeah you have glory in home and but but even more in Mar marilyn robinson you have the figure of jack mm. and i read jack as being you see i if you're catholic the strangest thing is not atheism but calvinism mm. i just think what yeah. like, like the, what that the people are predestined you know they're, they're the saved 
and they're not saved. So you can look around the room and say, you, but not you. And that's awful. I mean, that suggests there's nothing you can do. Why like you, you can't, like, going, like, going like you know, that if, if it's, it's, it's like being homosexual, like, you know, it's a, you're, you're morally disordered forever. And there's nothing you can do. Like celibacy won't help you, which is why I'm so appalled by the Benedict thing. Like, I think mm -hmm. like, like if you're really homosexual and you really feel all that, that is wrong. Just stop doing it. Give it up. Right. But Benedict will say to you, no, that's not enough. It's you. The eunice of you is the problem. So anyway, if, if, but it's a marvelous idea for a novel. If you have a character who's predestined, who's, who's one of the damned, who's not going to be saved, what's it going to be like in, for his family? And one moment Jack asks his, the other man, you know, the other clergy man, yeah. do you think that I could be one of the damned, one of the not saved, one of the predestined to... And the other man doesn't know what to say to him because how can you say it to someone? Yeah, you are. It's the end of you. Forget it. Like they don't want... They're very gentle, these two men. They don't want to say. But it's an extraordinarily dramatic idea that he's living. His very body is filled with this idea and it might be of, of, prede yes, of predestined <sighs> damnation. And... Um, so I thought, thought this was the most fascinating idea. I also thought the, the way Marilyn Robinson had sort of crept up on us because I, yeah, everyone loves that book. What's that first book called? Help me. Um, yeah, everyone loves housekeeping. It's it's just bravura. It's just like, yeah. you know, I love trains going over things and, you know, the whole business of, and, or, or, and, and the, the language. Aunts, the yeah. And, and, kind of chorus. Yeah. yeah. And then there's these, then I think 25 years goes go, go by. And I would love to know what was really going on. Because I'm fascinated well, she by her. She spent a lot of time in the British Library reading Marx. Yeah, yeah, she did that too. Yeah. She became interested in many matters. But the ne the next four novels are very gently written. Mm. They're they're filled with slow observation. I'm interested in slow observation. I'm interested in that idea of a plain style. That if you keep the uh, if you just keep observing, if you keep as your tutelary spirits Vermeer or Ernie Velasquez or Morandi, you know the the the, the idea of just plain light, um, slanted light. A lot of silences, a lot of good manners, effort at good manners, and then someone or other breaking those rules. And so I'm interested in her as a stylist, mm. but of course I'm fascinated by her as someone who's brought God into this um, into this into this country which is filled with God. And yeah. the novelists don't seem to have just because it's hard, you just can't go on about God in a novel. But she does, and so I thought she was worthy of a good lot. I mean, I spent a whole summer. You know, and then, you know, I bumped into her soon afterwards when the piece appeared, but she wouldn't let me know she'd read it. I had no idea whether she'd read it or not. No, I was going to say to her, I put my life into that piece. You know, the, but she just, um, she looked very enigmatic and, uh, and it was, um, it was, um, it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> I edited one of her pieces once and attempted to email her and received a note from her agent under no circumstances contact. Marilyn Robinson again. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a panel with her, and uh, I stupidly told this really stupid story that my mother, um, when she would, she didn't even she didn't even need some drinks, but she would just at night often say, "I'd love to have been Simone de Beauvoir." You know, I'd love to have had a, a man in some other part of town that I could see some else, and then I'd love to have had no children. <laughs> and then I would say, "Well." Why didn't you tell us? Like we would have not, we would, I would have not complained. And so she'd say, No, I love you all, but I'd just be better not to have had the children. And I told this to stupid, I'm telling it again now, looking at me, I'm an idiot. I told this on, on the panel. I was Marilyn Robinson really looking at me like this Irish person is insane. And um, I turned to her and said, Do you talk like that to your children? <laughs> And it was beautiful. I mean, I really I hope someone has made a recording of it. She just um, did her hair very well. And she said, no, I would like you to know that both of my sons are ontologically secure. <laughs> oh, wasn't that? It was worth it all <laughs> for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, should we see if the audience has any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Who has the I, first I think, question? I think I put a damper on That's, it. Who has? Yes. Oh, um, uh, as a journalist, I was, um, um, when I was 27, I got offered this job uh, editing Ireland's main current affairs magazine because the editor the, and the owner 
was going on to edit a Sunday newspaper. And um, he was a famous journalist and he was really brilliant at his job. And he was really, he really believed that journalism could change things. And I was a little cynic and I didn't believe that. And I thought our job was just to attack well-known people. And he thought, no, it was to bring them to account. But I couldn't see that. And um, so um, he, he was always putting pressure to, uh, to, to, to do more. And the problem was, was just, just, just to do more. And it was, a, it, was, it was a monthly magazine, which meant that you were working incredibly. I mean, people don't, it's so hard to remember. It's like the Industrial Revolution, where you were, you were, you were, you were, you were putting in the corrections with gum, with glue. You know, and everything was hand done and the pages and all that. And so they were, you're working maybe intensely for about 10 days of the month. And the other 20 days, you could devote, you know, 10 to just lying around and enjoying yourself. But 10, you had to do something useful and be seen to. So I decided that I would write a, um, there was nothing either academically or from the academic side, from the journalism side, there was nothing about the Irish Supreme Court. And I realized here, here we have a Supreme Court that a book had come out in America by Woodward, I think, called The Brethren. Yeah. And there was nothing like this in Ireland. So I decided as a way of trying to justify my salary that I would go and see these judges. And of course, they had ruled, again, I mean, being homosexual is such a nuisance. They, they had ruled, unfortunately, these gentlemen had ruled in the year I started in this magazine um, that there was a case brought to the Supreme Court saying that... Um, that the laws, the Victorian British laws against homosexuality, still on the Irish statute books, should be declared unconstitutional because there were clauses about right to privacy, right to bodily integrity. It was an argument you could make. It was an argument you could win. It was an argument you could lose. It was brought into the court by Mary Robinson, who later became president of Ireland. And it was brought into the court, say, in 79. The judgment then was in 82 or 83. And because it went to the high court, then it went to the Supreme Court, and they ruled 3-2 against us. And um, some of the language in the, in the main Chief Justice's ruling was really, really offensive. And um, it was based on evidence that no one had tested. And it was all about that we go around today spreading diseases and that people, they all seemed to believe that people, that it was contagious, that people could become homosexual by being around homosexuals, which all they had to do was ask one of them. We've been trying all our lives to turn our best friend. <laughs> and it, like, it, like it never, ever had happened. And like, Mr. Justice O'Higgins, could you like, just ask me, don't like, don't tell me about this. <laughs> but in any case, I started to go and see these gentlemen. And um, it sort of changed me because I really hated, I thought they were awful people until I met them. And they were so welcoming and they were so interesting about how the law worked and how their own formation, you know, the, 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 there was a constitution in, put in Ireland in 1937, but they still pretended it wasn't there and they didn't run constitutional cases until the 60s. And they based then precedent. Precedent became American precedent. The American Bar Library sent all the books to the Irish Bar Library of precedent. So the suddenly barristers who suddenly were basing on British common law um, ex examples had to suddenly look to various um, um, American precedents. And they were really interesting about how this had happened, what the personalities were. I grew to like the most offensive ones. And I wrote a novel. I got a novel out of it called The Head of Blazing where I started to know about, you know, I got, I, I, I got softened by them because I saw them, they were like my uncle or they were like my father. And, and, and they were just that older generation who just couldn't believe that a man would have any interest in going to bed with another man. They just thought it was just absurd as an idea and they wanted to stop it. And, uh, uh, and um, so um, anyway, that's, so, so, I, so I wrote that, I wrote the, the, the first version of that piece in 1985, um, when, when, so, and then I rewrote it for another purpose. So. Who has the next one? Yeah, I haven't uh, looked at which people in the book, but if I would imagine that when Henry James um, comes up in the book. He's in the like Marilyn that. Robinson. Yeah, not much, yeah. though. Well, that's, that's, that's not surprising. <coughs> Um, I think it's just uh, that idea of being a guest at the feast. You know that when I was 19, I think I was at home for the summer and I simply picked up Portrait of a Lady. And it's interesting, you know, there was nothing in common. It, it's not as though this was my world. I was suddenly seeing the very world. I mean, I, you know, it was, I wasn't reading Joyce, you know, and I wasn't interested in Frank O'Connor or any novels with 
Irish rain or masturbation, all those Irish things, um, that um, the glamour of this and the moral questions raised in it and the sense of style in it really took me over. And, and, and it might have been that the whole idea of secrecy and the amount of secrecy that's in the book, who doesn't know what, must have meant something to someone who was homosexual in a, in a very conservative society. But it wasn't just that. So I just simply love I just simply loved the book. And I went and read more of his books and I thought he was marvelous. And when I went back to university, I thought everyone would agree with me. And I found that I was more or less alone. People just thought I was just completely, uh, uh, you know, like, why would you read him when you could read Ulysses, for example, or you could read The Magic Mountain or, you know, so um, it was just me. Do you write your essays concurrently with your novels? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, it's always an emergency. Something you, you, you know, you, you live like this, where you know, you're always late with a piece. Mm. You always plan yeah. to do it in April so you could start your novel in May. Yeah. You've started your novel in May, you haven't still done the piece. It's June, you better do the piece because someone is really going to come down on you like a ton of bricks if you don't deliver. <laughs> I had there? a cascade of editors emailing me every morning over the fall asking where the piece was, how it was going, and... Uh, said it's gonna go great after i finish this other one first yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 who's next just wondering thinking about the marilyn robinson piece the problem of religion the novel how you think about you know moments where there's something religious or supernatural happening in your own books and like Nora webster when she sees her dead husband at the end of that novel or specifically you know the testament of mary uh, yeah, how you think about it. Like yeah, yes, in other words, you can't do it. But if you if you write a novel in which the spiritual, the sense of the ineffable, the sense of the beyond is completely missing, th then they're just busy counting money. You know, that, that that you have to have something in the language, even in just in the in even in the language itself, or some sense of a possibility of transcendence. But you must never go there. And then in Nora Webster, I'm sorry you raised it because I realized I, I there's only one thing I want to do in this book, which is I want her to see him. I want him to come in as a ghost into this house. It can't be done. Don't bring ghosts into your novels. Like, don't. It's a cheap thing. It's cheap. You know, like he's dead. She's trying to put up wallpaper. You know, write about how you hang wallpaper in a small uh, semi-detached house. You know, what sort of paste you use. Like, go and research that. Leave, leave the ghost. Oh. <laughs> and then it wouldn't stop. And therefore I had to do, you know, okay, she's, it, I had to give Henry James, sorry, he, he says that, 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 that there, there, there's, there's a plausible explanation for, um, the, for the turn of the screw. You know, the, mm. like that only the, and she's neurotic and she's right. suffering and she's the only one who sees these figures. The children never see them. So, so then you get into the fact that she hasn't slept for a very long time. The insomnia has been just atrocious. So she's in this state. She puts on the Archduke trio, which for her has a sort of magical meaning. I I'm in a house on my own in Wexford. I have been there for days. I am playing my Archduke trio all the time. Da, da, da. If I ever hear it again, Jacqueline Dupre, Daniel Barenboim, and, and Pinkett Zuckerman. And um, I have on the table, I have Hamlet. I have, um, is, is, I'm going to get this wrong, is, is, is Little Gidding, isn't it? It's where the compound ghost, um, where Elliot sees th this ghost coming in the, in the dawn when he's, uh, I have that. So I have two efforts at ghosts. I, I, oh, maybe I have a Tom Gunn poem called The Reassurance. It's about someone coming back after the dead and reassuring him. I, oh, I have Milton's sonnet about his dead wife. Me, th me, he, he thought he saw my late, my, my late wife. And so anything I ha have around on the table, and I have them there. And so I get up at about six in the morning. I say, I'm going to do it in real time. If this doesn't work in real writing, if this doesn't work as I write it, I can never do it again. I can never say, I'll go in it another direction. I'm going to do this as though it, it's real, as though it happened. So um, she goes upstairs. She hears this noises, and she goes upstairs. And there, there are various things taken directly from Elliot, his downturned mouth. The sound of the, of the of the klaxon of a car, they're they're from that's from the four quartets. So I'm like using that as an anchor, something just just to hold it down somewhere, and he's in the room, and um, it's th this becomes very personal. It becomes odd because I'm actually 
there with them and um in the in the novel she has four children but in my family there were five and he can't remember the name of the fifth and the name of the fifth is dead by this time and he just says no the other one there's another one and it's just there because i want it was becoming real for me as i was writing it you know that what would he say what would he ask and and then just the fact, the fact that he fades. But I'll never do it again. I will never, <laughs> ever, ever, ever do it again. And I don't think in the Testament of Mary there's anything much. I mean, the Lazarus stuff, but she doesn't see the Lazarus stuff. She hears about it. I can't have her witnessing it because she actually is, is the sort of secular figure who, who knows everything. So it's only once. And it's like, um, I don't know what else, but there's things you can do once in your life. But ghosts once. <laughs> One more. Thank you, Tracy, for one more. Yeah. Um, thanks for the wonderful conversation. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, somewhat facetiously, maybe, that as a student had written the, it all started with, is it the or my? It all started with my book. My, 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 yeah. My, yeah, it was a crucial decision. Yeah. My versus right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that there's a kind of maybe judicial divergence where who would have tinkered with it or maybe played with it or scrapped it all together yeah. had it been a student. So this this divergence maybe between uh, the, we'll call it the professorial mind and maybe the literary <laughs> mind. <laughs> um, I don't teach creative writing anymore, so I, I you know I'd leave students alone. Um, and uh, but I mean I teach um, I teach literature, and uh, I, I find that very useful just to, to really looking at novels, and looking at how they work. And uh, so, um, but you see, you can't really start anything now. It all started without you know, you know. The, I mean, the reason I went on writing that piece was that that the opening sentence suggested a sort of comedy. It suggested a sort of right. a sort of picaresque adventure. Our hero suddenly <laughs> loses one of his balls. What's going to happen next? Our hapless hero. Whereas, you know, so that, that was why I went with it, because the opening sentence was a cliche. Mm. You know, it all started with, it all started. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, but I wouldn't recommend other people to use cliche in the opening sentence of a piece. You heard it here first. <laughs> Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Calm. Thank you, I'm very thank honored. You. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you signing books? Yeah. All right, Calm's gonna sign some books. Here you can sign one. Is that okay? If you keep all the books. What? If you keep all your books. I'm constantly. Well, you have a choice I get, about. 